All right, so let's get into the event tonight. Um, so the topic tonight is, is one near and dear to my heart as someone who's worked in startups between the US and China for the last five years. And I've had many friends who have hopped back and forth between work in Silicon Valley and Chinese tech companies as those Chinese companies have grown into some of the most dynamic and influential companies in the world. Uh, many like myself and a lot of members from YCW who invested time and effort um, studying Chinese and studying in China want to leverage that skill set that they built by getting a job related to China. Uh, the good news is there are some incredible career opportunities right now to be part of Chinese tech companies as they go through their international expansion. Um, so you may have seen this where we post the event and kind of the big headline is TikTok is going to hire you know, up to or maybe over 10,000 people just in the US as one sort of dramatic example. Um, people often wonder how someone based in the US can even begin approaching the job search into these kind of companies uh, from China. Um, you know, what kind of talent are they looking for and how should you find a company that's a good fit for you? Um, today, we bring in the top experts to answer these questions, um, including Joyce and Nicholas, who are founders of a platform built specifically to match internationally educated talent with leading companies in emerging markets, including China. So without further ado, I would like to uh, introduce our two speakers. So first we have uh, Joyce John Gray. She is the co-founder and CEO of Alaris. Uh, Joyce was previously the first employee and VP of sales for Human Interest, a fintech startup backed by Y Combinator and other top Silicon Valley VCs. In Asia, she worked for the president of Microsoft Asia Pacific in Singapore and as regional manager for Groupon China. And in Africa, she worked for the World Bank's International Finance Corporation in Nairobi, developing the East Africa community's common market protocols as well as for a behavioral economics firm doing work in public health in Zimbabwe. Uh, great to have you on, Joyce. And I'm just going to jump in. I'll finish the intro so we can get all the formalities out of the way. We have uh, Nis Nicholas Mansk. Uh, Nicholas was previously a diplomat for the US Department of State working in Asia, the Middle East, and Washington, DC. As a diplomat, he was tasked with advancing U.S. economic negotiations, foreign investments, and international entrepreneurship initiatives, including coordinating $500 million of financing for a Middle Eastern government in conjunction with J.P. Morgan, coordinating technical linkages between top U.S. universities and emerging market universities, allocating U.S. STEM scholarship for hundreds of emerging market students, organizing Global Entrepreneurship Summit, a preeminent annual gathering that convenes entrepreneurs, investors, and their supporters, and serving as US consul during the Arab Spring in the midst of terrorist attacks. He was also the founder of Verdict, a social polling and news aggregation website. So welcome Nicholas as well. Thanks for having us. All right, so with the formalities out of the way, um, I would love to sort of kick things off and set the context and, and just sort of op leave this open question on how have career opportunities for internationally educated talent at Chinese multinationals changed over the last five to 10 years, because um, as anyone here who's been back and forth between China and the US, um, let's say, you know, studied abroad in the early 2010s and now, uh, you know, what has really changed? Because it's changed pretty quickly. Sure. So uh, I graduated from college 11 years ago, and uh, these opportunities were not available, or at least if they were, I had absolutely no idea how to find them. Um, so I was studying Chinese at, uh, at college. Um, I studied abroad in, in Beijing, at Beida, had an amazing time. But when I graduated, really the only option that I knew of was becoming a diplomat. So I took the test, had a really great experience, went overseas, they posted me to a bunch of countries. I worked, I, I loved the work, um, but I was really struck by something, which was there were these amazing companies in all these countries that I was you know, being stationed to, and there was some really cool tech talent. Um, and sometimes they would come to the embassy for help, but we just wouldn't, we didn't have kind of the networks as a diplomat to connect them, to help them uh, expand and go global. Um, and they were really fascinating what was going on in Silicon Valley. So um, I was just kind of perplexed by this, uh, by this conundrum. And um, I don't know, I wanted to do something about it. The challenge though was um, in, in the government, um, it, it can be a little bit difficult to implement new tech. Um, it's, it's hard to update new computer systems and, you know, we have classified computers too, so you can't just, uh, you know, install some new code instantly. So, uh, I, I thought, wow, this is really cool. And I, I wanted to tackle this issue with, uh, my best friend from college and actually I'll, I'll let this segue to Joyce. Thanks, Nick. 
And, um, you know, I do really feel blessed because Nick and I, we actually met pre-frosh weekend. So as high school students, and we bonded over the fact that both of us were really passionate about international relations, about China. We actually had, um, we're on the founding team of the Harvard Association of US-China Relations when we were in undergrad. And it had an exchange program where um, students would go to China to mentor high school students and teach them kind of a liberal arts education as part of a free, like, you know, summer um, volunteer program. So it's something that I think has been a passion of ours for a long time. And I just feel really blessed that we got to take something that we enjoyed both academically and, and um, turned it into something that we could actually do full time. Um, for me, I moved to New York right after college. And then after working in New York for almost two years was actually recruited by an American tech company that wanted to do global expansion in China. So that was Groupon. Um, but yeah, so it was really fascinating because at that time, you know, Groupon was expanding really quickly. And I think even to this day, many companies that are trying to go for an IPO, which Groupon, Groupon was at the time, if they want to call themselves a global company, they have to have a China presence. And um, you know what better to help you create your China presence than people who are bilingual, who are able to work very well with HQ in the US and understand like sort of American norms of doing business, but at the same time be able to lead and manage and recruit teams um, in a market in which you know having language fluency is really important. So it was an incredible experience. And I would say that it you know taught me a ton of things about what to do and what not to do when it comes to global expansion, but it's it's hard. You know, at the time people used to say, oh, you know, Americans, and they even st still say that to this day, like, you know, Americans don't know how to localize. They're like very bad at um, succeeding in China. China is, is like a beast unto itself. And I think you see the reverse happening and we'll go into more details later in this talk, but when Chinese companies come to the US, in some ways they fare even worse than when American companies go over there. But, you know, the early wave of globalization, I would say is West goes East and consumer brands tend to do pretty well. like. Nike, Apple, Kentucky Fried Chicken, PepsiCo, a lot of these brands have done quite well in the Chinese market, but um, you know, tech companies have struggled for a variety of reasons. So that was my first foray into kind of building those bridges and, and being part of that expansion. And then later I got recruited to Microsoft APAC and some other opportunities. Um, but you know, this initial love of trying to find some way to combine a tech enabled solution and to build bridges in a mutually, you know, win-win situation between the US and China on a business front just persisted. So Nick and I teamed up a few years ago and here we are with Alaris. Yeah, and I, I think the examples you give, uh, like the Groupon example, or just sort of other companies in that earlier wave going into China, are those, you know, if we're talking about what's changed in the last five to 10 years, do those opportunities still exist? Or would you say, relatively speaking, those opportunities are smaller than or harder to get than, you know, say, working for a Chinese company outside of China? I'll take that. I think those opportunities exist, but the profile of people they're looking for has changed. So mm -hmm. in the early days when an American company went, so one of my mentors was the head of a large investment bank um, that opened up in China and, and was able to open up the China office for this large investment bank for the first time, you know, bulge bracket, Wall Street firm. And, um, and that was kind of innovative because she was actually Asian American um, and spoke Chinese and English. But before her, all the people who opened up the banks before were expats. And that was because the only leadership they had. And when you even think of the waves of migration and people who are, you know, bilingual and um, have have that background like there wasn't a huge supply of it in some of these large american corporates so they would usually send an expat over the expat would be setting up the office but it's a very long and pretty expensive process and they would usually have to work through translators um, i'd say the second wave of talent for this kind of expansion would be you know a lot of chinese americans or people who are you know fluent in chinese and have studied it um, and they're also expats but they go and they're much more localized and now we're increasingly seeing that for these kind of opportunities, the preference is for Haigui or people who are born and raised in China. So I would say that for a lot of recruiters, their kind of ideal demographic is someone who went to like Beida, Tsinghua, Fudan University for undergrad, and then um, you know went to the US and studied at a top MBA school, maybe worked in the US for a year or two, then came back to China and worked in China for a few years to show that they're like very localized. And then they kind of take on some of these roles or, they come back straight from the US, but again, have to have very deep connections locally. So that seems to be, even though there are more positions now, those positions have become more competitive because the um, landscape has changed. However, 
there's a lot more positions now in the US for people with um, the kind of China background. Right, and that could be seen as, as a positive. I, I know a lot of people kind of want to have best of both worlds where they might not be ready to leave the US and move permanently to China, which is what would be necessary to be localized enough. So it may be good news for people to hear, okay, those positions may actually be open in the US now. Um, and then, uh, so speaking of opportunities that are, um, you know, outside of China to work for these companies, where are Chinese companies expanding or withdrawing from internationally? Um, so not just the US, I know Alaris is, so just to give more context to attendees, um, Alaris is active, not just with Chinese companies, but other emerging market uh, based companies. So you guys have a view on, you know, Southeast Asia or other markets where Chinese companies are active. So anything you can comment on about where, you know, there might be opportunities even outside the US? Well, I can let Nick talk more about the US, um, some of the US companies and, and sure. uh, case studies we've worked with. Um, but just to broadly answer your question about Southeast Asia and, you know, one belt, one road, um, China's definitely investing quite heavily in a lot of the emerging markets. And um, expansion into Southeast Asia, I would say they don't really view even as global expansion, it's more like regional expansion. And their target is usually the Chinese diaspora because there's significant numbers of Chinese, you know, immigrants and Chinese speaking, um, you know, first or second generation Chinese in these countries. So I would say that it's not, it doesn't take on the same quality or characteristics as when they're really truly trying to go global and establish themselves as an international brand. And, and Nick can speak more to that. Sure. So this has um, this has changed a bit in the last few years. Um, I would say about five to eight years ago, there was actually a really big push for Chinese companies to physically come to the United States, um, set up physical offices, buy real estate, um, build an entire operations. That slowed down a bit during the Trump administration and also a kind of CFIUS um, or U.S. government scrutiny of investments really picked up. Um, but what is still very present is China wants to access the United States in terms of software or kind of virtual or remote solutions. So we're seeing lots of growth in SaaS products, um, apps, um, entertain like internet and gaming apps. And then the cool thing about these projects uh, products is China or um, kind of our big growth areas are China, India, Singapore, Indonesia. They can put their products anywhere in the world. They just have to hire a country manager. So we've worked with companies and they're, they're coming to us because they want to expand to the United States. They want to expand to Latin, uh, Latin America, Africa, put some in Cairo, some in Morocco. Um, so it is really exciting. There's, um, the world is truly, it's truly globalization in both directions right now. And do you have, uh, just to give some more sort of practical direction to some of the people in the audience, what are some example uh, companies, or if, if even if not companies, maybe categories of apps, um, just to give sort of more of a tangible example? Sure, I'll start with one. Um, I assume many people have used the, um, the online system InVision or Figma before to do like design work. Um, there's a Chinese competitor in this sphere. Uh, they have an amazing uh, product, beautiful aesthetics of website. Actually, you would go to the website and you wouldn't even know that it was uh, not an American company, um, but they're, they're trying to expand uh, globally. They're just struggling because they don't, there's a lot of things different about the US market. Like, you know, if you're going to promote a B2C app, you need to understand social media and Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, it's all blocked in China. So this company was actually telling us about their struggles of like uh, trying to find uh, YouTube influencers to promote their product and the YouTube influencers wouldn't even work with them. Um, so what they need is what the, these companies are looking for is people who have an understanding of the American space uh, who can help them. So that's just kind of design app is just one example, but the big categories we see are ed tech, uh, entertainment, like live streaming apps, um, and then kind of different SaaS solutions. They could be for anything like accounting or for cybersecurity, uh, you name it. Okay. And I can do a quick screen share as well of our website because if people are interested, you should um, certainly um, go to alaris.com, um, you know, quick plug for it. And we have a couple of uh, case studies as well. But you, if you even think about, obviously we, we talked about ByteDance and TikTok as, um, a prime example. When those, when that app took off in the US, most people didn't realize it was a Chinese company. And actually the precursor to that was Musical.ly. Um, Musical.ly was really popular among Gen Z in the US, but in China, ironically, it was not very popular. When I talk to Chinese friends, they explain it as, 
our youth are so busy studying for the Gaokao, they don't have time for the frivolity of like American youth. So part of the reason they expanded so much into the US is because precisely because it's a much better consumer market for them. Um, you know, it was way more adoption, it was way more um, Uplive is another uh, social social live streaming platform. So it was just way more adoption for them in the US market than it would have been in China. Um, so if you're interested in any of these positions, we encourage you to just go to alaris.com and you can um, you know, just fill out our quick application form. And if there is a match for, for a company, like, you know, based on your skills and everything else, then we'll contact you. But, you know, this is just a quick plug to go to alaris.com slash candidates. And I can also put that in the, in the chat room. Yeah, but no, I think, I think TikTok's a really good example. Uh, one, because it's relevant, because there actually are a lot of positions open and people are now several years later, very familiar with the brand and understand it has real traction in the US. And is, you know, the ban has been reversed. I know there was kind of, uh, everyone was holding their breath to see if they would continue to expand in the US. But I think um, it also is a good example of, you know, how much localization help they really need, right? So I know people from Facebook trust and safety that have gone over, right? So there's all the legislative and policy side of localization they need help with. Um, then obviously there's the marketing. They ran huge campaigns on YouTube and other social platforms to drive traffic there. Um, so I think if people are sort of, trying to slot themselves into an opportunity with one of those companies, you can think of them as kind of a, an example that's made it to large scale, but they'll need help across the functions. So if you have that bicultural bilingual skill set plus some function, uh, you know, some subject matter expertise, you can be really helpful. Um, and I'm going to, I'm going to jump one question here just to segue into that one. Uh, Cause I think it's a relevant one, which is, um, and maybe this Nick, you can kick this one off. Um, how should people make themselves marketable and differentiated to these companies, right? So if you want to get, you know, this top, uh, maybe not, you're not going to get the country manager position for TikTok that might be <laughs> already taken. But if you want it to be sort of a leadership position in one of these leading Chinese companies uh, expanding in the US, how do they differentiate themselves? Sure. I'd say the first thing is Chinese companies often gravitate towards brand names, perhaps it's because they don't have as deep an understanding of the American market and they can't, you know, understand like the nuance of if I worked at this company, then it means that I, I'm going to deliver these results. So um, quite frankly, like a university or a kind of brand name employer that you've had in the past can go a long way to setting yourself up. If you don't have that, though, um, just even an experience or project that you've worked on in the past can go a long way. Uh, the second thing that I would say is kind of language abilities. Um, just to give you an example with another client, um, their international, actually their head of um, BD uh, was the only person on the team who spoke English. So every, every other person only spoke Chinese. So if they're going to hire someone in the United States and that this person is going to be able to collaborate with the entire team, there needs to be at least some level of Mandarin to keep, uh, to keep the exchange going. So I would say work on your language abilities. Uh, Joyce probably has a few other ones to, to add. Yeah. Well, um, you know, as Nick was saying, language abilities are really important, but it's also about cultural competency and cultural fluency, because I think one of the things that they find is, and, and language is often a heuristic for that. Like if you went through the trouble of, you know, studying at Beida when you were in undergrad or getting a degree in China, which, um, you know, if there are any, if there are people who are interested in pursuing um, a degree, we actually, one of our partners is Hong Kong Baptist University, and they're offering a full, um, all, they're, they're offering a, a scholarship for a one-year business, international business master's. Um, so, you know, we can also send this link over here. Um, th this all, like, part of the reason these are really important, like, you know, top business school, global community, international exposure, et cetera, is because um, it actually, there's there's just some sort of, I suppose, je ne sais quoi when it comes to being able to traverse the line, because um, there's just a lot of cultural differences. I know it sounds cliche and many of you have probably heard that term about like culture shock and why is it that it's so hard and things that for many of you, because you have lived in a, uh, you know, very diverse environment, you don't know all the things that other people struggle with. But many Chinese companies, I think, make the mistake of coming to the US, just as a lot of Americans did, the same mistakes apply in both directions. They just bring their expats over. The expats like stay in a hotel or Airbnb in the US. They only speak Chinese to each other in the team. They only interact with the local Chinese community. They are very uncomfortable speaking English and they try to do sales and recruiting and set up operations, but usually it doesn't go well. Like we've talked to certain companies that are clients of ours who've had a presence, so to speak, in the US for over three years and spent a lot of money on it. 
and didn't get a single client because they sent their own expats over who had just no local connections and local know-how. And um, that's why it's incredibly important for them to have people like all of you serve as bridges and be able to feel comfortable you know, going out into the market or going out and doing BD, but at the same time communicating with the team. Um, and so I think that cultural competence and empathy is also important because many Chinese companies also find it then, so the first stage was, okay, we're just going to send our own expat. Then they realize this doesn't work. Then they just try to find some random American that they find on LinkedIn. And they just like message a random, tons of random people. They're not, again, they don't know how to do recruiting in the US. So the vast majority of good candidates will probably reject or decline or just not even respond to their messages. So there's a little bit, bit of an adverse selection bias of the ones who actually do respond. And the ones who do respond, the Chinese companies aren't screening initially for like, do they seem like they understand China? They're just literally finding anyone who they think looks and seems like a prototypical American. And so the person might eventually end up agreeing to a job, but then there's a lot of friction and they end up churning after you know, a couple of months. And the friction, we can go into that later, but you know, as you can imagine, there's just a culture clash. There's a lot of um, inexperience from the people that they just randomly find who don't know how to, you know, who don't know how to be that bridge or who don't know how to cooperate well with the home office and who also feel frustrated because you do have to be a little bit entrepreneurial. If you're the country manager for a company that's based overseas and you're the first person who's really taking their product to market, it's not just, there's an easy playbook, there's a team to support you. It, it does take a lot of self-motivation and um, it's not, you know, a task for everyone. And I want to dig into something here just to give like a, a concrete example that we've chatted about before in terms of the culture difference, which, you know, one might be in say, uh, HR policy or like feelings around, let's say, taking time off of work, right? I just want to pick one example to give people sort of a, a, a real, um, a real example. So um, I know something we chatted about before is, you know, in the interview process in the US, asking about what the culture is around taking time off or what the PTO policy is, is pretty normal. Um, and you'd want to ask that to know and see how you fit into that. But we've talked about before, you know, how you broach that topic with China headquarters could be different, right? And what they want to know from you before you ask that question. I thought that was a really great example. I'd love if you could kind of uh, explain that one, Joyce. Sure. Um, you know, I think there are lots of both tactical things and it, it also just requires a high level of EQ because of course every interview is different, every company has something that's a bit different, but one of some of the common themes we see is that Chinese companies, especially tech companies, tend to um, work like all employees and founders tend to work really hard. And you know, there's the there's the 996 or 996 um, concept, but there's also just people both love what they do and there's also not a lot of work-life balance or work-life separation. Um, and one of the examples I love to give is like, if you even think of WeChat as a product, the fact that WeChat is used for both work and family communications and your boss can basically be messaging you on WeChat at all hours of the day and night and people respond and they are habituated to respond right away. I think that's a level um, of intensity that is sometimes a little off-putting for people who've never worked in a China context before and that they find difficult to navigate. But then the Chinese companies on the flip side will feel a little frustrated because again, they're used to employees being really responsive. And if the American employees don't respond to them quickly or tell them, you know, sorry, I'm not working outside of nine to five a.m. to p.m. Eastern Standard Time, um, which corresponds to 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. China time, then you know, that's also going to be something that's a little frustrating. So even very small things like navigating boundaries and time zone um, and kind of work commitments can be something that just takes, um, takes communication, but it's also not something that most Chinese companies necessarily respond really well to if the interviewee before they even have an offer, just state that up front. And I think a lot of um, Americans tend to do that because, again, they want to make sure to set boundaries. They've been taught the American way of negotiating. And um, it's also very different. I do think Chinese companies need to adapt because the way it works in China is, especially if you're a big tech company, it's so prestigious to get a job there that um, they have no problems. It's like, it's a huge country, huge population. They're, they basically, the company holds all the power, but in the US, talent tends to hold a lot of power. And the way that you court talent, especially in you know Silicon Valley and tech companies is you're really like 
whining and dining them basically like maybe in a virtual world not so much physically but in a in an emotional sense you're really really bending over backwards to show your culture to show them how much you value them to really sell them on the interview so every interview is not just you evaluating them you know that they're evaluating you and a lot of chinese companies that haven't quite internalized that yet because they're still in that mindset of everyone would be lucky to work for us. And in China, we are such a big deal and everyone wants to apply for us. I don't understand how that doesn't translate over into the US. And so, you know, um, kind of being thoughtful about it, understanding that even if the companies don't have all the, um, they're not, you know, going about recruiting in a way that is uh, perhaps how an American company would do it. It doesn't mean the company doesn't value, value you or want you. And um, once they really, really like you, we've seen so many Chinese companies just really bend over backwards for employees and really treat them like family, really take care of them. I think there's just a level of almost like care and like, um, you, you know, like company uh, company dances together or, or end of year parties or like sending you gift baskets. Like there are just so many ways in which they do show that they care, but it's usually after you've proven yourself. Because again, culturally, there's a lot of this concept of you need to like eat bitterness or chikhu and like really be in the trenches with them and show how dedicated you are before they invest in you. Whereas a lot of Americans are like, I want to negotiate my contract and I want my salary to be really high. I want to get all the benefits and vacation days set up up front. And I want you to make all these promises to me before I join you. And, and sometimes that can just lead to friction. I'm just gonna jump in really quickly and give an example uh, about how this kind of manifests itself. We really see the old mo globalization model in which you parachute in a 40 year old white male with family and you know, send the kids to boarding school and you know, everyone wides over on a first um, you know, a business class air ticket. We don't see that very often anymore. Uh, it said it's very scrappy. Um, oftentimes, I mean, they're looking for people. One of our clients says, we want people who are pirates and who are gonna be scrappy and figure stuff out. Um, and uh, if they make it, they really reward them and they quickly move them up in, in uh, levels. This was really cool to see with a bunch of our, our candidates. Yeah, so I don't wanna, I guess to summarize, don't wanna scare people too much, right? I mean, it is intense. You don't wanna beat around the bush. It's an intense culture, but there are rewards to it. I mean, a lot of, at least some of the success that you see of these companies can be contributed to the intensity of the culture. Um, but you kind of need to go in knowing that and you know have the, cultural sensitivity to not sort of torpedo your candidacy by, um, you know, being too demanding upfront in sort of your negotiating style. So I think there are definitely rewards to that, that type of culture if you can find the right role, which then uh, sort of segues us to, you know, from a candidate perspective, and when you're advising candidates, um, how should they go about vetting the best companies to work for from China? So, you know, there's the really famous ones that people may even already have a friend working at like TikTok. But there are other small and medium sized ones that are really good opportunities as well, where you could get that kind of country manager position because they're at an earlier stage. And those might be harder to vet because you maybe don't know anyone who works there. So, um, you know, Nick, if you want to kick this one off, um, you know, how would you how would you advise candidates to in the interview process, try to figure out if it's a good team to work with from China? Yeah, it really is a challenge. And actually, this is the pain point that we saw uh, when we first started. We uh, we had this. Uh, uh, there's this client, it's an ed tech company. It's actually the biggest ed tech company in the world, valued at $15 billion based in Beijing. They were trying to recruit Americans. Um, they would message them on LinkedIn, but it would look like a scam because it was written very poorly. The information on the website wasn't very good. Um, so you just had no way to vet them. And also you didn't know people who had worked for them. That's why we really, that's kind of how we got the idea for Alaris. We serve as the platform to connect both sides um, and vet both sides. So we only make sure to work with quality employers. Um, I saw someone posted a message in the group chat. Our model is um, we either, just depending on the company's needs, we either place the employee directly with the company, or sometimes, you know, if there's a Chinese company and they want to expand the United States, but they don't have a legal entity, um, we're, the, we're the kind of platform in which they can hire the American through us and then work for the, work for the foreign company. So we provide a lot of that vetting. Uh, but beyond that, I mean, it really helps to have language skills, to have studied abroad, to be, um, also have kind of reach out to your friends and your network to who can give you some insights on if it's a good company. Yeah, anything else you wanted to add to that, Joyce? Yeah, I think it depends, you know, for candidates as well, it's really good to just think about what is it that you want in this next stage of your career, because it's not for everyone. And just as working at 
Google is very different from working at a startup. Working at TikTok is very different from working at an earlier stage Chinese company. And there's actually a lot of competitors even in China in the video streaming and you know social uh, social media space that is a competitor, a direct competitor to TikTok that's also entering the U.S. market now. So for some people. Um, it feels risky, but just as joining a startup is risky because the same things that we touched upon earlier, there's not a lot of social proof. Um, you don't know friends who work there. They're still earlier stage. It might be a little chaotic. I think if you just adopt the mindset of if I join um, a company and I become their country manager or their first BD person or one of their first hires, that's what I'm setting myself up for. I think it, it makes it on some levels more palatable because even at a startup in Silicon Valley, people are working around the clock. There isn't a lot of you know, work-life balance and people are just so enthusiastic and passionate about what they're doing that they are um, just willing to, to kind of put up with a lot of flack. But if they're not if they're not really in that stage of life, which is totally fine, if they're if they don't want to take on as much risk, um, then it's much better to work for a larger, more stable company. Yep. Um, and if anyone has, if anyone in the audience has actually interviewed with any of these companies and has questions about sort of vetting from their experience, we'll get to Q and A relatively soon. I just have two other quick questions I want to touch on before we get to a, a couple of the questions from the audience. Um, one is, um, are there any sort of uh, case studies of candidates you've worked with in the past that you could give as an example, just so people can see a career path. You know, what did, what did they study? Um, or, you know, what kind of topics did they study at school? What, what job experiences did they, did they have before they worked for a Chinese company? Because I know, Nicholas, you mentioned, uh, you know, having a brand name or, uh, or project example you could point to um, was a good way to get their foot in the door. So I, I would open this up to either of you for kind of a case example. You can take it, Joyce. Oh, sure. Um, there are a couple of case examples. Like, so I'll I'll give one that I think um, is really interesting because it shows just that unique confluence of backgrounds. So there was someone who, um, you know, went to a good school in the U.S., was a Schwartzman scholar, and also is um, Egyptian and Chinese, and so speaks Arabic, English, and Chinese. And then ended up working for um, ByteDance Mina because they also have a really big presence in the Middle East. And I think that just really captures the background of how you can really leverage your personal um, background. Because you know, one of the things that I that I think is really interesting is there are all these boot camps for becoming a software engineer or um, even a UI UX designer. And so if you can learn to do something in 12 weeks, on some levels, the barrier to entry of getting that job is not incredibly high if it's just a 12 week like accelerated period. But learning a foreign language, you can't do that in 12 weeks. You cannot become fluent in Arabic or Mandarin after just taking a boot camp. And so I think on some levels, um, a job that requires language skills is one in which you know that you're you're uniquely qualified. It's kind of a captive audience, and there's only so many people that um, could possibly fulfill that role. Um, and you know, for others, we have like let let's say again, Nick was mentioning if a company is looking for uh, like KOLs or or people who have like B two B or B two C SaaS um, experiences in the U S. And if there's already a layer of like management that is bilingual, then they might not have as much of a need for that person to be bilingual. But in that case, having you know subject matter expertise or being really excellent or plugged into a certain industry is helpful as well. Because um, you know if the companies are hiring overseas, they're generally hiring for go-to-market roles. It's usually you know sales, BD, marketing. Um, their product team is much cheaper to keep in Shenzhen. They might have some product managers in the US to help them localize the products a little bit. But by and large, um, if you're if they're going to hire someone who's cross-border, it's oftentimes for a go-to-market position. So, you know, growth marketing or business development. I know that, you know, this is also the interesting irony of having like a, you know, a, a certain pedigree academically, because a lot of people with that pedigree don't necessarily go into sales. But sales is actually a really valuable skill set because many of these companies ultimately they want to come to the US because they want revenue. It's not a nefarious, you know, tactic to try to get data from Americans. It's purely commercial. They they just want money and they see a lot of dollar signs when they come to the US. Yep. And and the go to market roles are also kind of the strongest representation of your cultural knowledge, right? I mean an engineer is not going to I don't know. I mean it's helpful to coordinate with other engineers in the same language, but um, it's not going to translate to commercial impact. I'm um, sorry, Nick, uh, I saw you were going to add another example. 
Yeah. Um, sales in BD is, I think, some of the biggest growth that we're seeing right now. And it's something that someone in the United States can leverage their skills uniquely. So just to give you an example, um, we have a bunch of SaaS clients right now who want to access the United States. What they need is someone to figure out the strategy of how to do it um, and then execute it with sales um, and uh, set up the demo calls and uh, book the meetings and close the deals. Um, it's, it's a really actually fun entrepreneurial role. Um, you're, you're like, you're the country manager in the way for, for a company that's VC backed and is growing really quickly. And there's going to be um, enormous upside. Um, so that's what we're most excited about. And there's so many people who can contribute to this. And we see Alaris as kind of the unique ability or the unique bridge to bring these two sides together. Yeah. Great. Thank you for those examples. And then last, last question from our list. And then I promise we're going to go through as many of these audience questions as possible. Um, would you kind of just share a little bit about your story? Um, I know you've already touched on some examples uh, or some of the pieces of the story about why you founded Alaris, but I think what's interesting is your story of founding this company is kind of the other option we haven't mentioned yet. If you want to work in cross border, which is you can also start your own startup. Um, so, you know, why did you, how did you come to that conclusion? And, you know, how has that experience been so far? Because that comes with its own challenges with you trying to run operations between here and China and other emerging markets. Yeah, well, I guess I'll start and then Nick can add, add on. Um, I think part of it is because both of us, I, I do feel incredibly lucky um, that I get to work with Nick because it just feels like fun. On some levels, it feels like the kind of conversations and intellectual debates we had in college where we get to just do the things that we really love, like you know, connect people, truly bring value and find something that actually is viable. Um, and some of it, when I think back to the inspiration is, you know, the, we, we just find cross-cultural exchange so incredibly valuable. We're both beneficiaries of it. And we just identified, you know, a need in the market that wasn't being addressed. And at some, on some levels, it was a need that we felt like we both craved these experiences and having like a go-to place where we could find opportunities like this, and it just didn't exist. And then, um, you know, I, I do think though, that we're on some levels glossing over all the pain and sort of like trial and error that we had to go through over the years to get to the point where we found sort of a repeatable process or, or a, a stage that it, um, that really worked out. But, you know, entrepreneurship, I think, is something that you really have to be committed to doing it for, they, they usually say the rule of thumb is you have to be committed to doing this for at least 10 years minimum. And it's very all-consuming. And so it's something that you really need to love. And luckily, I think we both really love it. <laughs> but it's not necessarily an easy journey. Yeah, um, it, it, it just helps that this is really our passion. Um, it's a problem that we saw in our own previous careers. Um, we love working together. We trust each other. There's, you know, there's high moments, there's low moments. It helps to be with someone that you're, uh, that you're having fun with and trust the entire time. Um, and yeah, I, uh, yeah, it, it, it doesn't feel like a job to me. I, I love it. Yeah, so definitely um, from my own experience trying to start a company between the US and China, they're, they're glossing over a lot, um, but no. I mean, if you're really passionate about it, I do think it's an option. Um, and I think this we've chatted about before as we were preparing for this, just like say learning another language is a barrier to entry in the talent market. If you set up cross-border operations, you know, if you're able to create a recruiting platform between these two countries, it's a huge pain, but it's a barrier to entry. It's hard to do that. It's hard to have relationships with employers in China and candidates in the US. So for people considering the entrepreneurship route, it, it is challenging doing it cross-border, but I think it also has its own sort of long-term benefits. Um, and I know people in the audience are also passionate about this space, could motivate them to, to do something like that. So to the questions, um, the first one that came through on the Q&A, uh, which I really like this one, uh, if one had an offer from Snapchat and from TikTok for a similar role, title and location, um, or you know, for any other Chinese tech giant equivalent, what would be the pros and cons of each role, comp, work-life balance? Um, so it's a pretty wide question. Uh, maybe you could just sort of touch on a couple points, but either Joyce or Nick, you wanna take that? Sure, well, first, congratulations. That's an excellent position to be in. And at this point, you should politely, uh, you know, negotiate your offer <laughs> because if it's a comparable, you know, if it's similar comp, um, they, they both really want you. So that's, that's really great. Um, obviously, like I said, politely, because no one wants, not wants to be um, pushy about it. But in, in general, I would say that um, 
you know, I think at this point, actually, TikTok or ByteDance has a very, uh, it's a very Americanized culture, like a lot of their senior leadership team is American, um, or, and of course, has that like, um, empathy and the ability to navigate in both markets. And so I, I wouldn't say it's as extremely different. Um, it's going to be much more international at ByteDance because the of the pool of talent they draw from, there is going to be a lot more, um, you know, I do think that there is a bit more diversity in terms of nationality. And I know they're pushing really heavily on diversity and inclusion, um, you know, hiring a DEI initiatives like LGBTQ plus initiatives. So there, there's a lot of that. And I think the culture at Snapchat is, um, you know, it's also very excellent at this point because it's more developed, but it also had its origins in, you know, being a bit more, um, in being like more rooted, let's say in Los Angeles and having a bit of that, uh, a bit of that vibe. So I wouldn't say that at this point, those companies are quite as different as if you were to go with like an earlier stage company. Um, but, you know, both of those companies have invested quite heavily in organizational behavior and in culture, and they're, they're following a lot of best practices. So I would definitely encourage you though, to get to meet as many people as possible in both companies and just getting a sense of how much you would like working with them, even back channeling and like, you know, connecting with friends of friends who didn't necessarily, you didn't necessarily come across in the interview process, because a lot of this comes down to the people you're working with. Um, rather than even, you know, the company as a whole, especially if you're going to start off in a virtual environment. Yep. You know, I think that's a good point that it depends who you're working with, with the scale that TikTok is in the US now. I mean, you're going to be so many layers removed, potentially from headquarters, if you're reporting to sort of like a country manager in their whole chain, it could depend on just that team. Um, and then Nick, maybe you can take this one. This is from the chat window. Um, what is the impact of the decoupling of the US, of I assume US and China markets on Chinese companies' expansion plans and the roles available for bilingual and bicultural talent? So I assume this is reference to the US China trade conflict and sort of decoupling that's come from that. Mm. Sure. So um, there, are, there are certainly more sensitive areas. Um, for example, I can see someone later in the chat um, mentioned the uh, uh, AI and AI speech recognition. This is a bit more, this can be a bit more sensitive. Um, and, um, you know, other things that can be a bit more sensitive are just um, kind of IP or um, pharmaceutical or medical, um, particularly as we talk about vaccines right now, uh, real estate. Uh, that's part of the reason why we have mostly been focusing on uh, products that can be delivered virtually, um, like SaaS and EdTech um, or education um, or entertainment. Um, like when, when Joyce and I first started Alaris, we were, um, we, we thought we were going to actually do something with the physical expansion, but that, that really was uh, made difficult by kind of the government um, regulations in the space. And it's tricky. And also just the decoupling makes all of that cross-border interaction so much more difficult. Um, you know, I, I can't tell you how many times it's it's difficult to get a candidate to talk to a Chinese employer when it, the candidate can't sign up for WeChat immediately. They need to be authenticated, and that can sometimes take days. Um, or emails that go to the Chinese employer are like bounced multiple times. It's a um, or the payment issue. It's like so hard to send money cross border right now. So it's really becoming difficult. But we do see um, a lot of growth in kind of the software space or virtual services. Right and. Uh, if anyone is curious, the last YCW session we did was with the US China Business Council, specifically on industries that are likely to be decoupled or not decoupled, right? So, you know, strategic deep AI or semiconductors or, you know, uh, 5G infrastructure. I mean, there's some that are very obviously not going to have opportunities anytime soon, but a lot of the sort of consumer apps and other industries that Joyce and Nick have already touched on are probably not going to be affected um, by the decoupling. Um, so this is an interesting one, and I'm, I'm not sure if, uh, if either of you kind of have a view on this, but pr probably do. A um, uh, question about workers' rights. My understanding is that legal protections for workers in China, such as discrimination based on race, sexual orientation, gender, age, um, or harassment have significant limitations. Given that these issues have come up extensively in big Western tech companies, do you have any comments or observation on how Chinese companies are approaching the issue? And maybe can comment on you know, how they would approach it with a US entity, because that's probably more relevant for the audience. 
Um, similar to my comments earlier about companies like ByteDance, they're definitely very proactive about it. And, you know, even their, um, even their, their like, all of their DEI initiatives, I think, are actually quite ahead of the curve, even um, by standards, by American standards. I think part of it is because many Chinese companies realize, especially ByteDance, since it was in the news so much, they realize that they're under increased scrutiny. And so they almost have to go above and beyond on that level. Um, but, you know, I think for smaller companies, they still don't necessarily understand because, as many of you probably know, when you spent time in China, this concept of uh, racial diversity, at the very least, is quite foreign to them because there isn't really racial diversity in China. It's an ethnically pretty homogenous country. And so, um, you know, workers' rights do exist. If anything, I actually think China is stronger on worker in certain workers' rights because of socialist, you know, roots than certain American companies. Um, but at the same time, like our conception of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and also our concept of, um, you know, what kind of team you want to build to make it diverse is not the same. So I think part of the role that we help them as well is kind of in that intermediation and helping them localize, because that is essentially part of what they need to eventually do, and why it's really important for them to have people, again, like all of you who understand their perspective and are not trying to castigate them and tell them, oh, you're being discriminatory because they're not trying to discriminate against people, not actively at least. It's just, they're, they're, it's a blind spot for them. So I do think this is something that will continue to improve. And I'm actually very hopeful um, because it's something that like, you know, they're learning as they grow and expand. And in some ways they're learning much faster than the um, Western companies had when they were going into China for the first time, <laughs> and you know, um, and and some of the uh, some of the sometimes like you know dis disregard or or sort of unawareness of certain labor practices and labor laws locally. Yeah, and it's also just something that we as Alaris, the platform, coach them on. Um, in China, it's actually quite standard to put your birth date on your CV. Um, that is completely un you know unpatible and illegal in the United States to request that information. So we just, we make sure as a Laris, as the platform that um, our clients are following the relevant labor, labor laws. Yep, yeah, and I think uh, and I'll, I'm gonna segue over to a couple questions about the mechanics of how your platform works, because I think this is really relevant, but you know, that is, I think a big piece of it. And I know you're saying, oh, it took a long time to sort of search around and find a repeatable process. But, but before then it was, I'm gonna assume very manual figuring out how to bridge all these issues, right? So you, you know, have seen all these issues of both cultural and legal type uh, problems. So someone said, and maybe this is kind of just a good open question for how it works. What happens once you submit a resume to Alaris? So Nick, maybe as the platform person, you can walk us through the process. Sure. So uh, the resume submitted, um, we of course have software to parse it um, and tag it relevantly. Um, those skills go into our database. Um, we, we set up a uh, kind of 15 minute interview for most candidates um, in which we just kind of talk about what their career goals are and get a better, better scope on what their background is. Um, and then typically within a week, we're able to match them to some opportunities. We can't promise this for everybody, um, but there is, there is really a lot of need right now. And actually we have kind of a, uh, a sur surplus of clients right now who are looking for roles. So as soon as we match, the next steps are, is we introduce the opportunity to the candidate over email, and then we bring both sides together for a Zoom meeting um, in which they can kind of get to know each other a little bit better. Um, and then it really, it just depends on the, the role. Um, like if, um, if it's a bigger company and they already have a legal entity, um, that, you know, that person is gonna be hired directly by the company. Um, if it is a company that's expanding in the United States, they don't have the legal entity yet. Um, oftentimes, you know, they'll, they'll test you up for a trial project, like do some market research or like a go-to-market plan that will pay you for this. And then when, when they're certain of how it's going to work, then they start the BD and strategy. Uh, uh, strategy. Yeah. Um, okay. Anything else you want to add on sort of the process piece, Joyce, or uh, what, what candidates can expect? I think that's pretty straightforward, though, in terms of, you know, you submit, you get some tags based on skill set, and then you facilitate the initial sort of handshake between the candidate and the and the company. Yeah, we we do find that you know it's oftentimes actually very helpful to have um, an intermediary or someone who can um, just kind of set expectations and convey things to each side. And for many Chinese companies too, they feel more comfortable with that. They don't like direct confrontation, and some things are not confrontational, but other things even, um, you know, figuring out the comp or, or like the scope of things, it, it can to them sometimes feel awkward because they also don't have 
benchmarks for it. So there's there there's a lot that um, having you know sort of an objective uh, facilitator does help smooth the path. And you know they they're the nice thing as well is there used to be this perception that oh Chinese companies can't pay. That's really changed. They can definitely pay for top talent, but it's just a matter of whether or not they think that talent is valuable and worth the expense because they're also very, I would say value conscious. If they think it's valuable, they will definitely, you know, throw a lot of resources at it. But until they feel assurances or comfortable that that's the case, um, they're going to be a little bit more, um, you know, they're going to be a little more conservative in their decisions. So. Um, another question on, on the Alaris uh, platform. Um, so as for two part question from Claudia, as for recruitment, does Alaris focus exclusively on the US or also look at other regions like Europe? And then part two, have you found Chinese tech companies who actually prefer not to have a China watcher or China speak, Chinese speaker in their global team so as to appear more international? Um, I'm thinking of big tech Chinese companies who today face PR or government challenges. Yeah, well, I kind of addressed the second question a little bit earlier on when I mentioned that um, the first iteration for some Chinese companies to come was like purely expats from China, and they were definitely not localized enough in the US and then they s tended to swing to the other side of the extreme, which is someone who um, seemed all American and had no ties to China and then that oftentimes did not work out because there was just a lot of friction. Um, so I do think that they're th as the companies mature, they usually have a wide variety of things. And many of the companies we talk to say that they want teams that are diverse or reflective of the overall population of the US. And um, and so, you know, it is a matter of like some mixture. If they already have the country manager and a couple of kind of layers of management that have that ability to serve as bridges, then the local hires don't need to have those qualities because if the local hires are just working with the, the country team, then that's totally fine. Um, so, you know, again, bigger companies have that, but it just really depends on the stage of the company and their needs. And then as far as the question about Europe, um, we have helped some companies that were doing expansion into Europe, but our main focus is on um, U.S. based or U.S. educated talent because it's just such a huge market and the United States has so much great talent. So that's that's our core focus. Thank you. And um, another here, and I think this is an interesting topic we've chatted about before on remote work. Um, so do you know of any Chinese emerging tech firms that recruit overseas candidates in regions they do not currently have plans to expand to physically? In other words, um, to what, uh, in other words, to what companies look for uh, remote contracts or I assume remote roles? Hmm. Um, yeah, absolutely. This is a uh... This is definitely growing right now in the midst of COVID um, because you can't physically set up an office anymore. Um, so uh, the big things that we see are entertainment companies like live streaming apps, um, things like TikTok, EdTech companies. EdTech is actually one of the biggest growth areas during COVID because everyone was online and like couldn't go to school. So there's some really cool apps that are coming out of Asia, uh, Vietnam, Indonesia. Um, and yeah, they, um, they wanna make money wherever they can. So they will, um, if some of our clients are very opportunistic, they say, if you can find me the right profile in this country, we're absolutely going to expand because we can like within six months, if that person's good, we can already cover that person's salary and we can make it profitable. Um, so some of these, you know, that, that was the case for a client um, who, who wanted to expand to the United States, Latin America, India, um, and Indonesia. So it's very opportunistic. If you can kind of present yourself well, you know, we can match you quite quickly. Great. So, so there are opportunities for remote, um, either to be kind of uh, there ahead for when they expand, before, like, you know, six months in advance of them expanding. But what about, I mean, are there any, I, I assume the audience member is also interested, are there any sort of skills that they would be willing to hire remote, even if they didn't have plans to expand there remotely, uh, expand there in the future? So, you know, say, are you kind of like a subject matter expert that they would hire remotely? Oh, yes. Um, so that's a good point when you bring up subject matter experts. So um, some of the Chinese companies we've worked with, although I, I think that they tend to want professors and people who uh, we've definitely had a lot of Chinese companies ask us for Nobel laureates who would be able to be uh, remote consultants and they're able, they're willing to pay. So, you know, um, that, that is, again, cost is not a barrier for some of these companies. And so they, I, and I think, again, it comes from this place of like deep 
desire to learn. They recognize that there's a lot of knowledge and, and again, Nobel laureates, I think it's just partially it's branding to say, oh, we have an advisor, we have a speaker who, who is a deep subject matter expert in this. And partially, partially it's because they are very humble and they acknowledge like, you know, many American companies have done this before, many American experts have done this before and we haven't. Um, even when it comes to organizational behavior, we've had some companies say they want business school professors to come teach them about how to create a better work culture. I think that shows an incredible capacity to learn and grow and a growth mindset. Um, so yeah, they, they might get some of these like very um, preeminent experts and professors it, without necessarily wanting to go into that market, but they want that person to, you know, teach them how to do things the right way. Right. Um, and I don't want to go too far over the hour, so I just want to leave a couple minutes if there was anything else that um, either of you wanted to close out on in terms of, you know, how to connect with you and how to connect with Lars. Yeah, I think um, we showed everyone the website. Feel free to add us on LinkedIn. I think that's probably um, an easy, easy one. You can just find us by our names. I'll just type in my URL here because uh, and then Nick's I'll type in as well linkedin.com slash um yeah and please feel don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions we'd love to hear from all of you and especially if you're interested in any of the roles potentially or in studying abroad in hong kong on a fully funded scholarship please don't hesitate to apply on our site for any of these things great well yeah thank you both uh joyce and nick for joining us today i think uh this is really helpful for the ycw members and um, like they said, they're they're happy to keep in touch. So if you guys have follow up questions, I know we couldn't get to all the Q and A. Uh, feel free to follow up with them or or go to their website. Um, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, really appreciate it, and hope to see you at future events. Thanks, Thanks Mike. Thanks, Thanks, Wilson. Mike and Wilson. All right. Take care, everyone. W. Bye.